Welcome, I'm Randy Randall and I'm here from Desert Point Kennel to talk to you about German Short Hairs. I want to talk to you about German Short Hairs worldwide and I want to talk to you about the history of the German Short Hair, what they were designed to do. And um, I want to bring it down to America and, and tell you what we have here and what we're doing. So often when I see German Short Hairs explained, I, I get I get the message that they're only designed for upland birds, that they're just a pointing dog. And even their name would suggest that, German Shorthair Pointers, that's what they're called here in America. And so people think that they're just like any other pointing dog, and they're designed to hunt and point birds, mainly upland game, and that's all they, that's all they do. And the truth is that's not what they, that's not what the the dog was designed to do. The dog was designed to be a versatile hunting dog. And right now in America, we have come to the point where we have a pretty diverse gene pool. That we, at one time, where we were headed only to pointing dogs, and pointing uh, groups and tests were uh, almost all they had. Now that has changed quite a bit, and one reason is is because we have the DK system here. We have the Deutschkutzar German, which means German short hair. Uh, the German club is here now, German club of North America, and they're they're doing well, and they have their dogs here, and they also have NAB, the North American Versatile Hunting Dog Association, and that's here, and they put a great emphasis on water work as well as the Germans do. And then we have UKC that um, is aligned with National Shoot to Retrieve and they they are also able to do water work now. And where at one time you could not compete a German short hair in a, in a water work trial. Now, now you can. So the dog was designed before the 1870s independently by German breeders to breed a dog that could do it all. And in Cigar's book, 1951, he said they were all in accord. They all bred a dog that would fully respond to any type of work in the field. Woods or water, excellent and all. Work means hunting, okay? So they would respond to any type of hunting in the field or on the water. And any type just doesn't mean pointing upland birds or pointing birds. And that means hogs, pig hunting, that means fox hunting, cat hunting, that means tracking down deer, that means um, bringing down a, a wounded deer, the, that means of course water work, duck hunting. They wanted the dog to be versatile where one dog could do it all. Where you could go out in the morning like we do, leave the house just about any type of, time of year and, and hunt a variety of, of, of game which allows you to extend your season, which allows a hunter with one dog or two dogs or three dogs or even more to hunt every single day of the year if they wanted to. Because we can go out in the morning <clears throat> and, you know, we can hunt Eurasian doves here all year long here in Arizona. So, you know, if one flies over, you know, we can shoot it and work on the dogs retrieving. If uh, we get into a covey of quail, you know, the dogs are going to work that and it's good for the puppies. And if they tree a fox or a cat, you know, we can deal with that. Um, and then we can go from there on over to the water and jump some ducks. Or we can later in the evening, we can do a set and, and call in some ducks. Or in the morning, we can do that. And uh, we can do all of that in, in one day, in one hunt. Plus rabbits. There's a lot of rabbits. So they learn to point rabbits, chase rabbits, you know, find rabbits. Uh, you can do so much more with a German short hair than than people think, and people get caught up in that it's just a pointing dog. So they oh, if you do those other kind of stuff, you'll run the dog for pointing, you'll run the dog for birds. But that's that's not the case. The more you can do with your dog, the more enjoyment you you and your dog are going to have. The dogs love these outings. The dogs love doing anything in the world anything in the world with you that's how they were designed they were designed to be a good family dog 
And anyway, before 1870, the Germans independently were trying to breed this type of dog, but there wasn't a, a lot of consistency on who was using what. Some people were using this kind of hound, or maybe somebody else was using another kind. You know, there was an English pointer that was out there, but remember that the Germans aren't real fond of the English. So they got the German, old German pointers, which they really liked and, and they wanted to use more of. And then they had the French pointers as well as the Spanish pointers. And they utilized all of those. The hounds they used were probably more versatile than we think of as hounds now. They didn't use big bloodhounds like you like some of the books make you think they had hounds that would do water would go into water and hounds that would even you know retrieve so they wanted to blend these dogs that they had to produce the dog we have now and in 1870 they formed their club and then they really started concentrating at that time solidifying the breed into one breed the German short hair and here in America the dogs came in in 1925 Dr. Thornton from from Montana was reading a magazine and it talked about the virtues of a German short hair and he, he he told his wife he said I have to I have to get I have to get this if I have to move the world pretty much I'm gonna try to get me one of these so he imported and in 1925 that was a long boat ride and a long train ride but he imported I think at least 13 and he got pretty wise and pretty savvy and understood um, which dogs that were good which dogs to import and he would even import them while they were in whelp so he loved the dogs he had had setters and he loved his setters but he he got rid of them and he just kept the German short hairs he called them the every use dogs said they would do anything so he did a lot of ducks in the coldest you know just right up until the the ice was there and he said they were wonderful and they were super smart on pheasants and they could handle pheasants and he had a dog that could even tell the difference between hens and and roosters and he, he just loved them but he would also use them for for you know to treat like hound dogs he said they made fantastic cow dogs smarter than any cow dog he just he, he just raved about them so he went to register them to get them registered and established and he wanted to call them pointer retrievers and it's like you can't do that you know well you gotta pick one you know you're gonna be a retriever and you're gonna be a pointer he says well they're they're both they're designed to be a pointer and a retriever and so he they pick pointer and maybe because of that you know the aspect of the pointy dog versus the retrieving dog you know has become the emphasis that the dog has been entered into more pointing activities with all the pointing dogs the trials were to compete against pointing dogs and they weren't even allowed to to be in retrieving trials in water work which they were really good at and so the dog became here in America for a time <clears throat> um, a specialty dog a, a big big running dog a, a pointing dog and the trials were set up to compete against pointers and setters and pointers and setters have big run and some of the German short hairs could do that and some of them couldn't well what happened was is um, if we kind of fast forward a little bit into the early 80s or late 70s there's a breeder of pointers named Whaley and Whaley spelled backwards is LQ and LQ is the most famous line of English pointers and LQ told the fraternity the pointer fraternity that hey our dogs are getting too big a run that you know we're, we're breeding these dogs just for run sake and style and we're not concentrating on what the dog was designed to do which was be a, a, a hunting dog for foot hunters and they didn't listen to him and the, the pointer just got bigger bigger run more style and you know you have to follow them off horsebacks which they did anyway but now it's like big forward motion the dog covers a lot of ground and and wait a second I don't I don't breed those kind of dogs and he won a lot and he just didn't compete in those big huge running trials 
he, he wanted a, a, a closer working dog. Well, I bring that up because the short hairs developed into a dog that would match step English pointers. And now we have dogs that are exactly the same as English pointers for run, and they will run just as far, just as big, just as wide as the best English pointers that are out there. So here's a dog that was designed to be a versatile hunting dog for a foot hunter and now we have a dog that is basically a, a pointing dog. And you ask the people why didn't you just get a pointer? I mean why if you're running those kind of field trials you know do you want a German short hair? And why do you want to change the German short hair into a, a pointer? And I don't know what the answer to that is. But the Germans were so concerned with that and that they decided they weren't going to even allow American dogs back into their system. So it flows one way. The German dogs can be come into our registries and be used as German short hairs, but our dogs cannot move back up to the DK system and be used as DK dogs. But since we have such um, a versatility, such a wide variety of um, groups, clubs, registries now worldwide that um, you can find just about any type of German short hair that you want. In England, in the UK, they have what they call a gun dog, a utility dog. And that dog is started off like ours did in the pointer group. But then they realize that they're not pointing dogs. They're utility dogs. And so then all the utility dogs, such as Weimarimers, Fieslas, they went into a, their own group and they compete against each other. And that's just, in the hunt point and retrieve and in the hunt point and retrieve they still have to do water work they, they but they do all of theirs on foot and the dog has to compete against those kind of dogs so there was no reason to develop a dog to compete against pointers because they didn't have to compete against pointers the Germans just um, you know they they belong to other other clubs as well you know like the the cat the group that covers all dogs in germany the dogs that you know tr track those kind of other kind of dogs you know they can they can do some competitions with those as well as the germans can put their dogs also register them in navda or any akc stuff if they want to and compete in that and still keep their dogs in the dk system so we have a versatile dog in America and we have um, a, a specialty dogs as well so it's up to you to figure out what they are but my job here is to try to explain what's out there so the average person can decide nobody calls me for the most part and says hey do you have a big running dog do you have a dog that just when I let him loose he's just gonna tear over the next horizon people call and say hey I want a hunting, hunting dog, a family dog. I want to, you know, I'm not going to do a lot of hunting. It's going to be mostly a family dog. Um, and we have probably 10 guides use our dogs now. And they use our dogs because they're looking for versatile, close working dogs. Even if they're only hunting upland birds and even if they're only guiding, they, they still find that the big field trialing dogs typically don't work as well. As, as our closer working versatile dogs do. So just because you breed a dog for versatility doesn't mean that he can't fit in a certain niche, you know, like a guy's duck dog or, or a person's pointing dog or their, you know, shoot to retrieve dog or their AKC test dog. Because they can do it all, that means they can do each one individually as well. So, we, we got, you know, the colors, I'm kind of skipping around here a little bit, but the colors are black and liver, black and brown. That's what they were. They were even in other color when they first started, and that was perfectly acceptable. Even black was there to begin with, even before it was reintroduced. But black, um, being a color that it is, has to be bred to so if you don't breed to it you lose it and so in the early 1900s early 1907 or so 
they reintroduced black in the form of Arkwright's an Arkwright English pointer black a black dog uh, Beach Grove Bess as I think her name was solid black dog and the idea was to get the dog's nose up off the ground and to darken the pigment of the skin and the eyes and that worked that worked well though the like Singer said that you know he didn't really feel that they needed to get the nose up the dog was already good that the dogs were already that they didn't really bringing in the black English pointers didn't improve what they already had just in the end gave them an, another color and and that's good I mean black German shorthairs are beautiful but because they never came to America the Americans were very centrist they they had no idea. We had no idea that there were even black German short hairs. And when they when they when they came in, we were using the old standard, old German standard that didn't show black at the time. And we kept we continued with that. So our standard, as far as AKC went, never even showed that there there were black dogs. So they came in and people embraced them, and they embraced them for a few reasons. First of all, they're from the Potmas Kennel, which is the oldest kennel in Germany, even older than Higgy House and Waschling um, and the other top kennels that are there. That that's the oldest kennel, and the guy that 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 ran and bred dogs through the Potmas line, you know, bred very 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 good dogs, and so every all the major kennels started using them. Wa um, Waschling, Axel's line. Um, the Heggy House line, the Whittakin line, um, they're all interwound. And so here, even though we may have been prejudiced towards black dogs, some of the dogs that we had were liver, their parents were black. And a black and a black can produce, a, mostly if they're, they're been inbred, they'll probably only produce blacks, but black and a black can produce livers. And blacks bred to livers can produce both livers and blacks. A liver bred to a liver can only produce a, a liver. So the number one dog, probably even that passed Axel is the most used dog, Ciro, is a black roan dog. So they used a lot of black dogs. They used a lot of blacks in their breeding. Um, and they came to America and we embraced them probably because they were versatile. Probably because once we bred them in with our dogs and we had a, a blended a dog, the, the versatility remained. So you, you have a dog that's black, it's pretty pretty good chance it's going to be versatile. And then they started using them in NAVDA, you know, sharpshooter, shooting star, line, man in black. You know, that was a dog that has a ton of drive and a lot of people use that dog and it's been producing fantastic NAVDA dogs. I've never seen a black dog that hasn't loved the water, that hasn't been a versatile dog, a loving dog, a kind dog. So colors colors can be secondary, but it also can be primary. If you get a white dog, you better think about why is it white? Is it a show is it a show dog white? You know, because they use a lot of white dogs that are show, show lines in their show lines, and that's a specific type of a, a line. Is it a German white, which means it's exactly the same as all the other colors in, in the German system because the dogs are exactly the same. So there is absolutely no difference in a white dog in a German system. Or is it a versatile white? Like Rob's a versatile white. The American versatile white dog has a lot of versatility in them, and that's fine it's fantastic I mean they do everything all the other colors do but there's also an American field trial white and that all line all goes back to most guard ebb and it doesn't matter if it's Dixieland Rusty and it doesn't matter if it's clown it doesn't matter who what lines they're all the same they all genetically are so close that their traits are solidified so if you get a white field trial dog for the most part you can pretty much bet on what it's going to do it's going to be a good big running dog it's going to point good it's going to back good it's going to love to hunt but genetically wise it's not going to be as versatile there's a good chance it's not going to have a natural retrieve 
and there's a good chance it's not going to like the water and there's a great chance it's going to run too far so in that case color can be an indicator so on one extreme we have an indicator in white and what it will produce on the other we have an indicator of black and probably the way that it has been bred is an indi indicator of what it's going to do so now so we understand how how they came to develop the German short hair they used um, pointers and hound dog crosses for the most part and they came up with a dog that could do it all a dog that could point a dog that would back a dog that would do foxes catch a dog that could tree a dog that could you know get find foxes a dog that would love the water a dog that could get ducks a very very versatile dog but yet a dog that was good you know in in the house and so in America we have all of that still worldwide you have to remember that they look at things a little different than we we for so long got to thinking that our dogs through AKC through the German Shorthair Club of America that that was the German Shorthair you know and if it was if the if the AKC didn't accept black then blacks must not be German Shorthairs if the German Shorthair Club of America doesn't accept the black color then you know they must not really you know if hunt test you know the way that we do it is the best way to do it if field trials are so popular and produce a lot of the dogs in the background of our dogs then field trial dogs are you know the the way to go but meanwhile the rest of the world's marching on with versatile dogs I mean I don't know any other country that has made the German Short Air into just a specialty dog for just pointing upland birds every other country has tried to keep the versatility and the water work in t intact and luckily America is such a big country and we're so inclusive that all these other now all of these other clubs and registries have been able to come in and make an impact because people why does why did NAVDA why is NAVDA doing so well because it's 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 breeding for a standard that we like, that the Americans like. The Americans like their dogs to be able to do, you know, water work. We want our dogs to be able to be a, a, as good as a lab. And I remember when I got one of my first DKs, I had a lot of DK blends. You know, they had a lot of DKs dogs in there, but they weren't 100%. I, it, they, they, even the old lines, you know, had, you know, had a variety of um you know different dogs that you know maybe some of them you know were had a little field trial stuff in there but i didn't have any solid dk's and i already had been breeding a while and i already really concentrated on water work i had great water dogs already and i decided that maybe because the dogs that i was that i had that were doing so good had DKs in them, maybe it was the DK dog that was better. You know, maybe if I went to the DK system, so I talked to the uh, Ranchi, the breed master, and talked to all the German DK guys I could find, and he set me up with a, a breeder that bred DKs. And I called him and I said, hey, I already have really good water work, but you know, I just want your opinion on how good the water work is on a DK. Is the water work, you know, as good? How does it compare to a lab? He said, it's better than a lab. I said, you know, I've had a lot of labs. I find that hard to believe. He said, no, they, they're, they're as good as a lab. We, we go, we're here in Michigan and we guide for ducks and our dogs are as good. And I said, well, that's good because that's what I'm looking for, good water work. And I didn't think I would improve my water work and whether I did by using the DK dogs or didn't, you know, our dogs have to love the water. There's levels of water work, loving water work. You know, dogs that'll go into water, they really don't like it. Dogs that like it, they'll do a good job. And then dogs that will love water, like a Labrador. We want our dogs to be good in the water like a lab, retrieve like a lab, and be lovable like a lab, but not have the genetic problems as a lab and be, and be versatile and live longer. So. I went up and I picked up two dogs 
and one was two years old, that was Buck, and one was eight weeks old, that was Barb. And I brought them back, and they were fantastic in the water. I mean, their water work was really good. And Barb was even at eight weeks going in the water trying to compete with the older dogs. Their water work was solid, but their pointing in the field was not, was, was lacking. They had a strong drive, they were always busting in, and they had to be brought back and kind of trained, you know, to point. As that's what I found with those particular two dogs and even the dog we imported from Germany, Sophie. She loves the water. She's fantastic in the water, but she has the same, the same bad trait. So, did the DK dogs improve what we already, I already had? Probably not. The good American versatile lines are as good, in my opinion, as, as the German dogs. Um, and better in some respects. So, you know, we have it here, but why do we have it? Because we can hunt. We can hunt year round. We can hunt anything and everything. In Germany, you probably are going to have to go in, study for a test, get a hunting license, be allowed to join one of the clubs before you're going to do any hunting. So they're doing a lot of testing. Well, if you want to raise great hunting dogs, you need to hunt. Hunting is the name of the game. They're versatile hunting dogs, number one versatile hunting dog in the world. But your job as a, a breeder is to breed versatile dogs that can hunt, and you can't hardly do that without hunting. The test duplicate hunts, but they're not hunts. They're planted birds in a field, and your dogs has to go out and find them, and they're very set up on obedience, and if you can train your dog to hold a point while you shoot and go retrieve the bird, they're going to pass the test. But Bodo said, even the German said, even the, the, this book said that, you know, there's no substitute for hunting. The, the breeder of, of Hege House hunted till he was 92 years old. So, you know, just because they can pass tests and do titles does not necessarily even mean that they're going to bring that down to the hunting level. Even so much that a NABDA VC, a NABDA Versal Champion, Bodo, who founded NABDA, would say that that's no guarantee that the dogs are going to pass on their gen hunting genetics to the, the puppies. So, you know, a hunting kennel is... Um, probably your best kennel if you're going to you know look for a, a German shorter that hunts but it doesn't mean that that the test are, you know that people can't do the test if you want to be involved in NAVDA and do that and do water work and you want to be involved in uh, hunt tests to get a master hunt hunting and you want to do field trials or shoot to retrieve go ahead they're fun but just remember that our five primary points are we want a good point, we want a good back, we want a good retrieve, we want the dog to work close, and we want the dog to be friendly and loving. So we know that and we do that by actually doing it. So the dogs will go into water and the dogs will retrieve ducks, that, that pretty much takes care of that. You know, if the dogs are putting stuff up trees, if they're pointing, they're holding points and they're backing naturally and they're covering ground and they're covering what they need to, to cover, and they're finding a lot of wild birds then that covers that pretty much covers that if they're good in the house and they're good with other dogs and puppies and they're they love people well that pretty much covers that while we're hunting they stay close i don't have to blow my whistle and they know where i'm at and they hunt with me and we're a team and they 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 like it as that as a team and they're not running over the horizon that pretty much covers covers that so let's get into the size of the dog real quick um, the German, the German standard is probably an inch taller. So where Americans are 23 to 25, you know the German males are 24 and a half to 26. The girls are 21 to 23 inches, and the females in Germany are 22 to 25. And that's measured from the withers. So from the ground to back up in here, that's the measurement. Um, we want a German short hair. I'm using this young dog that we have. Uh, it's an old German line. It's American lines. So all the, the good stuff, you know, Hillhaven Hustler, Trekker, the Ebold, he's got Bodo, um, the Rolf and Rolf and lines, uh, a lot of Hillhaven Hustler, a lot of Stradivarius. That's what makes up this dog. So we've got a good top line here, high up strong withers. It comes straight down, looks good, strong in the back. The tail is set high up on the back. 
you know, we don't want a straight up tail because it's not an English pointer and that's not the standard. Um, we've, covered, co we've covered color, you know, the care. You got to realize if you're going to get a German short hair, it's going to be an active dog. You're going to have two years of, you know, the dog being pretty hyper and wanting to need to burn off a lot of energy. And after two years, it's, it's, it goes downhill and you'll have a much calmer dog. And when it gets into, you know, six, seven, eight, you almost will have a perfect, a perfect dog. Um, but, you know, it's not the dog. Should do upland birds, you know, waterfowl, fur rabbits just about anything that you want a dog to do it's the number one versatile hunting dog in the world remember that the number one versatile hunting dog in the world but it's also probably the number one versatile dog in the world it'll do everything it'll do anything from you know fly ball to rally to obedience to dock diving to bomb detection to hiking with you traveling on your bike you know and it lives a long time 14 years old that's the age it's probably going to live. Does not have a lot of genetic problems. It's 98% hip dysplasia free, so hip dysplasia is almost non-existent. Um, we test in Wisdom, Wisdom Panel, so you get asked the people, you know, are you testing? We want to make sure that there are no genetic problems, so we test for every genetic defect in every single breed. And um, the, dogs are, the dogs are really super, super healthy. But remember that the dog was designed as a hunting dog and it's going to want to hunt and so you have to be careful with it. You know, it's going to hunt your cat if you're not careful and if you don't introduce it right and your neighbor's cat and it's going to be wanting to, you know, do hunting type activities. It's the top 10, it's in the top 10 most popular breeds in America right now. It's actually at number 9. And I feel that if it would have been bred to be a more versatile dog and we wouldn't have made it into a specialty big running dog, which um, can be a hyper independent dog, it probably would rival um, the labs because really there's, there's really no comparison in my opinion between a lab and a, a German shorter. And we've had labs, I grew up with labs as well as German shorters. A lab is a loving dog that loves to retrieve, that loves people but it's a specialty dog and a German shortage will do all of that it'll you know I mean we take our dogs out people come to visit with their labs and we throw a big stick in the canal and the two dogs are going at the same time typically the lab will be just a hair faster than the short air so they bring it back and the next throw the lab goes in the water and the German shorters are smarter and they're competitive so they go down the down the canal bank a little further and jump in ahead of the lab and they beat the lab the second time and they live longer and they're faster and they're they're not a heavy dog like a lab so their muscle tone is you know it's like picking up you know spring steel like picking up a tight football versus a lab is like you know picking up a drunken elephant um, they're just they're just better they're just better overall better overall dogs in my opinion, if you get a good one, if you get a good German short hair, you'll never have another type of a dog. If you get a bad German short hair, you'll probably never get another German short hair. So you have to do your homework. Talk to the breeders. Talk to what they're doing. Talk to other people that have them. You know, see what kind of dogs they're, you know, go out and spend some time with them. Borrow one. You know, find somebody that has one and take him home for a couple of days and see, see what you think. I used to always say, because we breed hunting dogs and we don't do the field trials. I mean, went to the NABDA judging seminar to make sure that NABDA wasn't doing something in their, their breeding and, and their dogs that I wasn't already doing. And, you know, of course, you know, I found out they, they weren't. But I always thought these dogs that people think are the most fantastic dogs in the world, like these field trial champion dogs, my dog is the best dog, he's the number one field trial dog in the world, they say. And it's like, okay, why don't you let someone take your field trial dog home for a week and take one of our dogs home for a week? And in that week, you spend the time in the house and you spend the time in the field and at the water and hunting, actual hunting, and then come back and tell me which dog you like the best. I think you're going to like the versatile bred German shorthair. 
whether it's a decayed German dog or whether it's one of our dogs or anybody else's dogs that have been bred for versatility and hunting, I think they just make the most perfect dog there is. Um, we covered colors and, um, you know, the pretty much the whole history of and development of the German short ears. We went over the size. Um, we went over uh, the stuff that I think was was important that a lot of people I listen to and have read about that that kind of miss. They're a fantastic dog. There is no other dog like a German shorter. We've de devoted our lives to breeding and raising and making other people's lives more enriched by having a German short hair. And we feel that they're just that good a dog. And you know, are there other dogs that are as good? The answer is no. <laughs> the answer is maybe. But with a big huge gene pool that we have, it's pretty hard beating being a German short hair breeder because you know you can just pull so many different dogs that we have you know we've tried all the different lines from a lot of the different top breeders and you know we know what's out there what works and kind of what doesn't work for us and then we've um, concentrated our lines to being very loving kind uh, versatile versatile lines and a lot of breeders out there are doing doing the same thing so just do your homework you know I hope this helped in you know, making your decision about a German short hair, either good or bad. There may be other type of dogs that may be better for you in particular. If you need to discuss anything, you know, we're at www.desertpointkennels.com. You can talk to me or my wife. You know, we're almost always available and uh, we're willing to go over just about anything that, um, you know, you want to talk about as far as German short hairs. There'll be other you know, we'll do other videos about breeding and about care and training and what to look for, what not to look for. But this is this is just an overview, the best overview of the German short hair set that I can do covering everything that I think is is important. So thank you very much. Good luck. Good hunting.